Rachel and I have um, been chaplains, and Rachel's a 10-year chaplain and um, involved heavily in our church as an elder and, and worship leader, and, and myself, I've been a uh, children's pastor and uh, high school pastor back in Melbourne, so, um, and also, obviously, a 12-year chaplain with SU. Um, and so it's just great to, to come to a church and be part of family and feel that connection straight away. And, um, and so it's really good. If Rachel or I are a little uh, slower in response today, we have been in an SU uh, Queensland camp. Uh, Rachel has been directing for nine years. Uh, this year was her first year that she was not directing the primary school camp for grade four to six. And um, we've reached that age uh, where we're the camp parents. And so... <laughs> Um, that was a new experience, so it was, it was actually lovely just to be able to uh, be those camp parents and rotate during all the meals and having the, the different groups come and sit at mum and dad's table and camp mum and dad. So that was a new experience for us, so we, we had a great time um, on that, but we are a little tired, and so um, if we're a tad slower, um, just please forgive us for that. We're going to go to Acts 13. Um, if you want to know what preaching style I am, um, at camp, I was described by one leader who's never met me, said, you're extraordinary. I've never seen anything like it. Amazing. He said, the things you do, I don't know whether it's biblical, but you do it anyway. And so that was an interesting um, explanation. Obviously, I'm very creative in in many of my sermons, but um, this morning we're going old school. We're doing an exploratory sermon uh, from Acts, and it's going to be simple. There's no PowerPoint, there's no, uh, there's no hammers and rocks like I had on camp, there's no slime that I was throwing at uh, leaders or anything like that. We're, it's a shame, yes, um, uh, as someone says. Uh, we're going old school, and we're just going to see what the Word says. And um, I really felt a real presence uh, to bring this word. And I was very glad that Pastor Doug uh, asked me to share on Acts 13. So we're going to Acts 13. If you've got your Bible or your iPad, Acts 13, 1 to 5. And um, a real critical, this is a, a launching pad, critical moment in the Christian movement. In fact, it goes from Acts 13, goes from basically no longer Peter and Jerusalem and the way, it now launches into the Christian church. And it looks at Paul and Barnabas and really launches Paul's ministry. Paul, who was called Saul, Saul, uh, from basically this point on, you'll notice that Saul no longer is mentioned. Saul stops being Saul and starts being Paul. It's a really critical juncture of the Christian movement and it's a real privilege to be able to share with you today. Let's see what Acts 13, 1 to 5, 5 verses. It's all we can fit in today and there's a lot in here. Uh, so Acts 13, 1. Now in the church of Antioch, there were prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon called Niger, Lucius, Osirina, Manian, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul, who is now Paul. Verse 2. While they were worshipping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. So after they had fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them and sent them off. Verse 4, the two of them sent on their way by the Holy Spirit went down to Cilicia and sailed from there to Cyprus. Verse 5, when they arrived in the Jewish synagogue, how about I read that again? When they arrived at uh, Salamis, they proclaimed the word of God in the Jewish synagogue. John was with them as a helper. So we have here a real launching out of 
Paul's ministry. Now, a few things to say, and probably how I'm going to how I'm going to go today is we're going to do the micro. We're going to look at what these five verses says, and then we're probably going to do the macro and look at what the broader picture for us and in our life and and what God's really saying here. So if you look here, so um, we've got some characters in this. Uh, we've got some prophets, we've got some teachers, and then we've got a whole bunch of people. And so we're going to look into what that is. You've got to remember that John Mark, who's actually mentioned in verse 12 as well, uh, John Mark was Barnabas's nephew. Now, Barnabas means encourager. So he's a encourager, and it's interesting that he was mentioned first. And if you look at the commentary, Barnabas is one of the leaders, one of the forerunners in the Antioch movement. They've basically gone from Jerusalem to Antioch and then they're going to spread out to the suburbs of Antioch and then to all the places around the world. Now what they're doing here is they're waiting. And so why I say this is pivotal is they're basically waiting for God and the Holy Spirit to do something and tell them what to do. We've had the crucifixion, we've had uh, Peter, the ministry in Jerusalem, we've had the 3,000 saved with the church established. Now they're waiting to go from the Jews to the Gentiles to be launched out. In fact, Acts, uh, you know, is the Acts of the Apostle. Many say that it could be called the Acts of the Holy Spirit. Such is the, the profound effect that the Holy Spirit impresses on them. You would have seen in, that, in those verses, you know, the Holy Spirit impressed upon them. Now, commentary would say it's not an audible, uh, you know, this is my son in whom I love. It's not an audible voice, but it's the Holy Spirit's Im- impressions on these godly group of people that are sharing um, and at Antioch waiting for God's instruction. So, We've got uh, Barnabas, he's a son of encouragement. Simeon, now Simeon, um, th- there's conjecture whether this is the Simeon who uh, carried the cross when Jesus could long, no longer carry it. Um, there's conjecture over that. What we do know is Simeon is, basically means black. So essentially he was from Africa, an incredible man of God. You'll notice that in this, Scripture, they bring people from Africa, Cyprus, they're bringing all people, key leaders, key Christians, into Antioch to launch into the outermost parts of the world the gospel. Now, we have Manius. Now, <laughs> uh, Manian um, is basically a foster child of Herod, not the Herod of verse of chapter 12, but He's along that foster family. Now, what do you need to know about Mannion? Very little, but he had a bad background. He had a troubled background, very violent, and basically what you need to know about Mannion is that he's been radically transformed by Jesus and his love. And so he's now one of the key people that's on this trip. And the first thing we see is in verse 1 and 2. And it says, Now in the church at Antioch, there were all these prophets and teachers, and it lists all the people, Barnabas, and Saul. Saul we know as Paul. Verse 2, While they were worshipping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said. Now, the first up point is God's fellowship. Now, all these key leaders and a group of people and prophets and, and teachers, they were all waiting for the Lord's instructions as to what to do. But you've got to understand the power of fellowship, what it meant. It's interesting, Luke was saying, and he said it twice um, this morning, he said, I really feel that it's a real coming together of family." And it's amazing, as we, we know, the Bible says, is our iron sharpens iron. And it's so important not to, the, to neglect the power of fellowship in this scripture. 
the godly fellowship of this scripture and this church. Um, and I want you to go to Ephesians 4, 11, 1. Now, Ephesians 4, 11, 1. If you haven't got your Bible, I'll read it out. Ephesians 4, 11 says this. Ephesians 4, 11 to 12 says this. So Christ himself gave the apostles and the prophets and the evangelists, the pastors, the teachers, verse 12, to equip his people for the works of service, that the body of Christ may be built up. There's a reason why all these people are here, waiting on the Lord, worshipping the Lord, there's a reason why. It's for the building up of the church, but it's also for the building up and launching into the ministry and the calling that God has placed on these people's lives. And it's so, so important that we, as Christians, learn that fellowship is key. It's key to whatever we do. See, prophets, they were uh, essentially, the, the, um, in biblical times, they were the inspired by God, in touch with the Holy Spirit, and they were prophesying and sharing what God had pressed on them. Now, teachers here, they were doing exactly that, but it was very biblically based. And so verse by verse, line by line, they would interpret the word and they'd be teaching the words of Jesus. So you've got all these people that have different roles within the fellowship. And none of them... None of them are better than one another and none of them are lower than one another. They're actually all needed for the body to function. And it's only out of this context of this group of people that they're actually able to launch into the Gentiles and essentially what we would see is, as um, the, the church outside of Jerusalem. And so... When we see these people in this church, in this, this group of, of believers, you've got to remember that God's present. Now, God's present one-on-one. Uh, -on -one. Do you know what? You can go home to, today and God can speak to you individually. You don't have to be uh, necessarily in a group with teachers, prophets, and then you've got all these godly people around for God to speak to you. But let me tell you, when you when we do come together as a fellowship and there, there are all those ingredients, pastors, preachers, encouragers like Barnabas, leaders who are able to be there, it actually can equip us to what God wants us to do. Sorry, I just don't get this much. I'll be fiddling with it all day. Um, so just, if it's looking weird, let me tell you, it feels weird. But, um, but praise the Lord. So what was I saying? Um, so, you don't have to hear from God, right? Um, you know, around one or two Christians, around a church. You can get revelation at home tonight as you're in the Word, right? Through prayer, through worship. It's great. But don't neglect the fellowship of coming together when you've got all the ingredients of encouraging, of leadership, of, uh, you know, and you've got to understand Acts here. He's, he's called Saul for a reason. Barnabas is a trusted Christian leader. That's why his name's first. He's a trusted leader. Uh, he's, the, he's the rock salt. He's the elder that we all know and love. Saul's not quite made it yet. Uh, Saul's a radical person who used to murder people and now he's about to be transformed and, and we haven't quite seen the ministry yet. And so... You've got to have all those ingredients in, a, in, in the fellowship to be able to launch out into what God has actually called them to do. Now, verse 2 and 3. Here we go. So, we've got, while they were worshipping the Lord and fasting, verse 2, that word worship and and, and that word ministering means worshipping God. So they were actually worshipping God. What were they doing? They weren't, when we say they were waiting to hear God and on what the next step is um, out of Antioch, 
they're not waiting sitting on their hands and knees playing PlayStation. They're not, uh, they're not just having a cup of coffee. What they're doing is ministering. Ministering here literally is translated worshipping God. They're helping the broken. They're ministering, they're teaching, they're instructing, they're actively living their faith. They're fasting, it says. While they were worshipping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. What were they doing? So you've got the first dot point, they were fellowshipping fellowshipping together in godly fellowship. Second point is they were focusing on the Lord. And they weren't waiting um, on hands and knees, they were actually focusing in on the Lord and doing the work that he called them to do. Colossians 3 is, is important instruction for us when we come around this. Colossians 3, chapter 3, 17 says this. Whatever, and talking to us, whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it in the name of the Lord Jesus. Gives thanks to God the Father through him. And then we go up to verse 23 and 24. And it says it even more plainly here. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters, since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. It is the Lord Christ you are serving. So it makes very, uh, it, it just backs up what we're doing here. They're actually focusing on the Lord. They're serving. They're doing the work unto the Lord. So many times, and I've, we're all guilty of this, we can do things in our own strength and we can try to you know, get the, the outcome we want but what they're doing here and what they're, they're showing us is when we actually do things in God's strength, as it, 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 A, it goes so much better, but we're actually doing it unto the Lord. And it gets results. It's much better than what we could ever do. Could do. But sometimes it's just a little reminder that what they're actually doing, they're not doing it to build the world's biggest church or fellowship here. They know that God's going to release them. They just don't know when or how. They're actually doing what God's called them to do. Now, the truth is, if God called them to build the biggest fellowship in Antioch, they would have done that. It, you know, if God said, just stay in Jerusalem and minister there, they would have done that. But it's, they were doing all this ministry unto the Lord because he called them to be there waiting and then to launch as a launching pad into what God has for them. And so we, we basically have this. And it says, verse 3, it says, separate Barnabas and Paul. And so we have the, the fasting and the worship. We have the focusing on Jesus. And just going back to the fasting, it's in. It's incredible that in Matthew 6.16 it says when, when we fast. So they're, they're worshipping, they're ministering to people, they're ministering to the broken hearted, they're worshipping the Lord, they're building each other up, they're actually uh, doing the work that God's called them to do and they're fasting and praying. And fasting, you know, Matthew 6.16 says, do you know what, when we fast don't be like the heathen and don't make a big song and dance that you're fasting and, and, you, and you're making a big note of yourself. And it's amazing how they were very disciplined in what they were doing here. This is a very strategic group of people that were, knew what they were on about. They didn't know quite what direction they were going to go, but they knew that God was going to do something and they just were persisting and they have been diligent in what, they, what God had put in their hands until he actually released them to do what he actually called them to do. And so we now have 
verse 3 where it says Barnabas and Saul are separated. Separate Barnabas, set apart, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. So that after they had fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them and sent them off. Don't neglect the power of laying hands on someone and praying for them. A hand round a shoulder of someone who needs prayer is incredible. Remember, I was a high school pastor in Melbourne. The non-Christian deputy principal, we'd ministered to him a lot, and I, I got on well with him. And he once said to me, and this is, mm, crikey, 14, 15 years ago, 15 years ago, um, he said to me, he says, Andrew, these, this day and age you can't even put a sh- an arm or a, or a hand on a child who's crying and weeping. And this is a school of over 2,500 and in Melbourne, one Turner College. And he just says the power of touch is so significant. I've always uh, remembered that from a non-Christian uh, deputy principal in my ministry, that the power of touch is so evident. Laying on of hands, an encouraging arm around someone. They actually prayed, they were together, they were united, they were actually uh, believing that God was going to speak to them and the Holy Spirit impressed upon them to pray, to lay hands. Why? And then it was only then that they're actually set apart, set apart the Holy Spirit for the work that I have for them. Set Saul, Barnabas apart. Now, Verse 4 and 5. The two of them sent on their way by the Holy Spirit went down to Caesarea and sailed from there to Cyprus. When they arrived at Salamis, they proclaimed the word of God in the Jewish synagogues. John was with them as their helper. They were sent out to preach the word. Now looking at the macro, so that's what's going on in the, in the Christian world at that time. Um, looking at the macro, do what God says. Um, it's so simple, yet we all so struggle at it. Do what God says. At, at, this, at this camp um, that we were doing all last week, um, I was a spiritual input person and I, I, I just have a process that uh, I call it, I don't know, four or five Ps or whatever. Uh, you know, uh, prayerful preparation pre- prevents pitiful performance, five Ps. And that's how I live when I preach or minister. And so I would, so why I say that is at 5 a.m. I would wake up, the alarm would go off, Rachel would say, kick me out of bed. And I'd go into the dining hall and I'd pray. I'd rehearse, I'd prepare, I'd plan so that the Holy Spirit could lead me in what I was to share to the kids. Now, on Tuesday morning and Wednesday morning, God said, remember the scripture of the woman at the well. Remember it. Very clearly. Now, an hour and a half later, after saying that at 5 a.m. or two, three hours later, I'd be doing my spiritual input. Didn't, didn't come to my attention. Didn't say it first day. Second morning, 5 a.m., Holy Spirit said, remember the woman at the issue with the, the woman at the well. Okay, I read this scripture. Okay, great. Four, four, you know, three, four hours later, I'd be speaking, you know, didn't mention it at all. It was only till Rachel came in at about 10.30 at night and said, oh, a leader wants to talk to you. So anyway, get, get in my slippers and my PJs and twaddle off. Um, you know, all of them, they're all 18, 19, 20, and they're playing Uno and stuff to midnight. And <laughs> Rachel and I just give us some sleep. Um, and, a, and a young guy who has um, OCD and what does that mean again, babe? Obsessive compulsive disorder. Incredible uh, growth in this young guy. And he says, 
he says, I'm really struggling for the last two, two years. This has just been getting too big for me. And it's just getting too much. It's holding me back from my Christian walk. And I just need God to speak to me. The Holy Spirit said, now I want you to share the woman at the well. Because the truth is, the woman at the well, God was very specific in what he said to her. He says, hey, you're on your fifth guy now. You're not married to the one. Uh, you're not here because of the fun. You isolated yourself from your community. And he, because of the specific word that he shares to her and the insight, she then says, hey, to all the town, hey, come and see the man who, showed, who told me everything about my life. And so she brought a congregation to Jesus. She brought him in. And so you just... Incredible insight into how the impact of Jesus speaking to that person, how it impacted her life. And I said to the, the young guy who was there, I said, well, I, I've shared this story and I think the Holy Spirit's saying that you need to pray specifically. You need to pray like God actually wants to speak to you about that. Because he was speaking to me in generalities and I, I didn't know what he was ask, asking me to do. But I said, you need to be like that woman at, on the well who actually just realised that God actually had the knowledge of all her problems all her life and actually she would come and you would come to Jesus with an open heart and actually see God release you into the ministry uh, that he's called you to do, just like he released that woman to actually bring the whole town out to hear Jesus. So do what God says. The other thing is, and I'm, I'm almost done as my time is there, process, process is key. This is a process. I don't want you to walk away from this, from, from today and say, oh, maybe I need to go to the outermost parts of the world and be a missionary because that's what Jesus did here. What Jesus did was a process to get people, a group of people, to their calling. It's a process. Rachel and I, we were married 14 months ago. It was a process. On our first date, uh, I said to Rachel, I said, well, it's nice to meet you. Um, I leave for Melbourne back home. I'm going to be a uni student. I leave for Melbourne in three months. I've been a 10-year Queensland SU chaplain. I'm done. Lovely meeting you. It's been great dating you. I think you're very nice. She, <laughs> she, she turns to me and says, that's great. I gave up on finding a guy uh, about a year ago, and so I've been planning on going for two months to Europe. I leave in a month. Uh, it's been nice knowing you. It is a process. God has a process in mind. doesn't matter whether you know what you'll be doing in five years' time. God has a process. The reason I, I spoke to my dad about oh, four, five months before I met Rachel, and my dad, who is a very loving, Christian, godly man, very conservative, would never, has never asked me, have I got a girlfriend? Would never ask me. Just would leave me to my own devices. Realise that I serve the Lord and, and he, he just allows me to talk to him. He said to me this one night, Hey, um, have you got a girlfriend? I said, oh. I was a bit surprised. I said, oh, actually, I really like this girl. He said, oh, that's good. He said, oh, God spoke to us this morning that to, to, to your mother and I that it's actually time for you to get a girl. <laughs> wow. I know I'm 32, but just don't put too much pressure. Um, you know, and so I thought, oh, well, you know, okay, that's nice. Holy Spirit said that, fantastic, good luck to you. The next 12 hours later, I was at a breakfast with Rachel's senior pastor, Dave Pros. And he said, oh, how you going? Yeah. He says, oh, are you interested in a girl? I said, oh. He <laughs> said, said, there's, interesting enough, there's a girl in your church that I actually like. And I said, I think I'm asking her to go out on a date. He said, really? He said, my family, my wife 
and my adult kids for the last 18 months every night around the dinner table have been praying that you and Rachel would actually go on a date. Um, it's a process. It's a process. I felt as... Sometimes, I don't know how you are, I am so thick sometimes the Holy Spirit has to just ram it into me to what to do because I've got no idea. And the Holy Spirit said, well, what are you going to do there? <laughs> I said, oh, I might ask her on a date. It's a process. But I, I don't want you to all leave the church and go to the deepest, darkest Africa. It's not what the scripture is about. This scripture is about they relied on the Holy Spirit. They relied on the Holy Spirit. They prayed, they fasted, they worked as a team, they knew each other's strengths. They just said that we're going to follow Jesus and the calling on his life. And I'm about to pray and hand back to whoever I need to hand back to. Um, I um, Pastor Doug um, wanted me to share this scripture. I was complaining about a week and a half ago to the Lord, walking. I'm a walker when I pray. And I was walking in the kitchen. I said, what am I doing? I don't even want to preach Acts 13. So what, I said, I've got six, seven better sermons that <laughs> I, could be, I could be more impacting. I could be funnier. I could be... <laughs> I, I, I know that there's gold in, and there's better sermons that I could preach. And the Holy Spirit says, you think that Doug asked you to preach. He says, I want you to preach Acts 13, 1 to 5 because God's going to speak to some people today. I said, really? And from then on, I didn't complain and I've just started reading Acts 13, 1 to 5. <laughs> and I'm about to finish with this. It all boils down to faith and the calling. You want to launch into, whether you're young, old, I don't care. If you want to know your calling, if you think you've got a better calling, if you think God's got a, uh, a new calling, you've got to realise it all comes down to faith. And this is, I'm going to share some of this. Then I'm going to pray and hand back. Noah would, was an ordinary man just like us. But with faith, he reached his calling. He built an ark and saved humanity. Abraham was an ordinary man just like us. Even though he was very old, with faith, he became the father to the nations. Jacob was an ordinary man like us. Even though he was a liar and a schemer, with faith, he wrestled God. And God gave him a new name, Israel, meaning the one who prevailed with God. Joseph was a man just like us who had, been, who had an impossible dream and destiny. But with faith, he became from prison a prime minister in one day. Moses was just like us. He had a stutter. He, he had insecurity. But with faith, God delivered him and the God's people out of the hand of Pharaoh. Joshua was just like us, even though he was full of fear, with faith, he brought down the, the great walls of Jericho. Ruth was a woman just like her. She had nothing, no hope, a widower, but in faith God gave her Boaz. Gideon was just like us. Even though he was hidden in the basement from the enemy, with faith he became a mighty man of valour. Samson was just like us. He had many failings, but in faith he prayed and with his hand he brought down the destruction and to the enemies of God, the Philistines. Samuel was just like us, a boy with faith. God gave him mighty prophet unto the nations. David was just like us. He was serving the Lord, faithfully looking after the family stock, but with faith he took down the bear, the lion and Goliath. Solomon was just like us. Through faith he became the wisest and the wealthiest man in the world. Nehemiah was just like us. Had a burden for his generation, but with faith he built the broken he rebuilt the broken walls and the city. Esther was just like us. Prayed and fasted for three days, but with faith, at her own risk of her own life, she saved a nation. Paul and Barnabas were just like us praying and fasting 
laying on of hands, listening to the Holy Spirit, together in one accord, Honda Accord, that is, uh, <laughs> classic, um, in one accord, but with faith, God launched them from their important ministry of what they're doing to actually launch the gospel across the whole world. And I was going to pray and then hand back. Lord, I just thank you for uh, every one of us here today. And I just thank you that, Jesus, it's a process. I don't know who's in this room that is struggling with a process, who maybe needs that Holy Spirit to speak to them, maybe needs that encourager Barnabas around them. But I thank you that you've got a calling for each and every one of us. And Lord, I thank you that you have set us apart for your calling, for your calling, for the ministry gifts that we can only do because you've called us. And I pray that, Lord, you would just launch us into whatever calling you've got for us. And if we're going in that calling and it's going fantastic, great. Keep at it. But keep pressing into the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit wants to set us apart, wants to create something new. And I just pray that you would bless everyone today that, Father, we would just press into your Holy Spirit even more. Set us apart, Holy Spirit. Whisper those utterance that only you can. We just pray as we worship, as we fast, as we seek your face, speak to us, we pray. We thank you, Lord, for your ministering that only you can do. Thank you for your love. We pray your blessing in Jesus' mighty name. Amen.